I'm Jeff Lynn, the uh, chair of the Innovation Task Force, and I'd like to lay the, lay the uh, groundwork for what we're doing today by starting back to say back in October, President Knapp appointed three committees made up of faculty, staff, and students. And those three committees were focused on a single thing, and that is the search for ways by which we could be more effective and more efficient in meeting the goals of the university. The committees were the Business Processes Committee, and that looks at the structure and the operational processes by which our university runs. The other was the, lead, the Learning and Teaching Committee, and that focuses upon a different kind of processes, all of those strategies and structures by which we engage students in the process of learning. And then we had a steering committee responsible for basically providing direction to the entire process. President Knapp could not be here today, but we uh, asked him if he would be willing to say a few words. So if you listen carefully and watch, you'll hear President Knapp laying the foundation for this. Hello and welcome to the showcase of ideas hosted by our Innovation Task Force. Your participation in this process will really be critical to achieving the goals of the Innovation Task Force and the main goal is to identify savings and gains in productivity that we can invest in our priorities, our academic priorities and in our student experience to continue to improve the university and to continue to increase our excellence in everything we do. We hope over the five-year period of this process, we hope to identify $60 million a year, that's $60 million in recurring savings that we can invest every single year in improving our programs. And that will have the equivalent of doubling the impact of our endowment, which currently provides about $60 million a year to support our programs. That's the payout from our endowment. We have a unique opportunity because unlike many of our peer institutions, we're not right now suffering the kind of financial distress that has resulted from the economic downturn, particularly for institutions that had endowments that were deeply affected by the uh, problems in the market. We haven't had the problem faced by public institutions that have faced severe budget cuts from their state governments. We have been able to continue to grow and to develop as a university, but if we can take this opportunity to identify savings in our business processes and innovations in the way we teach and learn as a university, we can reinvest those savings in a way that will really have a remarkable difference, I believe, and a tremendous impact on everything we do. None of this is going to be possible without the ideas that you, as members of our community, faculty, students, and staff can provide, because you see the way we operate every day, you notice those uh, opportunities for savings, for reducing waste, for reducing duplication of effort. And if you can help us identify those, I'm sure that we'll succeed. I look forward to the task force's report, and I can guarantee you that your ideas will have a direct influence on the recommendations the task force will be bringing to my desk. So once again, welcome and thanks for participating. This is his initiative. He made this very clear. And it's not that he controls it, but he feels very strongly that he wants to support it, and most importantly, he wants to move forward with it. Now, we, in this initiative, we really have, we're, and we're still going through the stages, there, there are basically four stages in the Innovation Task Force. The first one was gathering ideas. And I have to be careful here because we're still gathering ideas. Somebody asked me, at what point do you stop gathering new ideas? And the answer is, you really can't, but our initial initial thrust here was to gather as many ideas as we could. The ideas then went into our two committees, business processes and learning teaching. They took the steps then of analyzing the ideas. That's the second part, to take a much more careful look at the ideas that came through and then begin to dig through to see what kind of impact the ideas would have. The third and again, this is President Knapp making it very clear, was to share the ideas with the GW community, to get input from faculty, staff, and students about the ideas. And that's where we are today. That's stage number three. 
I'll explain this a little bit more toward the end of our gathering today, but the fourth then will be the decision point. We will take the ideas, we'll take your input and put those together, and each of the committees will make a presentation to the president and his senior staff they will then make the decision about which of the ideas will go forward for initial implementation. Um, what we're going to do today is share with you 15 top ideas. The 15 top ideas are those that have bubbled up, they have gone through very careful analysis. These are not the only ideas, but these are the ideas that the committees feel will have the greatest impact at least initially. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the committees to make a, sh a brief presentation on their ideas and then we'll break up and talk about each one. You'll have an opportunity then to do your talking. And that's a critical point. Our objective today is to listen carefully to how you feel about the ideas. You may feel strongly uh, opposed or for them. Uh, probably more importantly, you may have some other ideas in terms of how to make these work. Okay, our learning and teaching committee will take the will make the first presentation. Diane Martin, who is the associate vice president for graduate studies and academic affairs, and then Dave Steinauer, who's the chief information officer, have co-chaired that committee. There's a lot of work that goes into creating these ideas and bringing them to a level where we can present them to the community. And we had to pull on a lot of resources outside of our committee. And I want to give a special thanks to Jessica Dennison out of the School of Engineering and also Gina Fernandez, who was part of the committee. But they did the background work and pulled together all the information that the faculty could pull together to create these ideas and bring them to the level where we could actually present them to the community. So a special thanks to them and also Rich Constantino for allowing us to use Jessica out of their department because we literally pulled her out of the School of Engineering for probably a little over a month. Uh, with that said, also thanks to the committee because it was a lot of long meetings, a lot of uh, good discussion and uh, testy discussion at times. And the first thing we did in the process was we spent several weeks trying to clarify the role of what we're about. And, and the main goal is to raise this $60 million to bring back to the university to reinvest in the academic program. And our committee, which is the learn and teaching side, struggled quite a bit with that because we were torn between the money piece, which is very important, but also making sure that what we bring to the committee and to the university also uh, improves the experience and the learning experience and the overall experience for the student themselves because that was very important to the faculty that sat on that committee. So we got past the, uh, the role of the committee and then we came up with formulating some ideas within the committee. And we came up with about 10 really solid ideas, we thought, and then we started getting things from the community through the website and we went through each one of them. We had actually a total of 37 ideas that were presented through the LEARN Committee. And with that, we did a deep dive, what we call a deep dive, doing a full analysis from a financial standpoint of what it means to the university, what it means to the student for their experience, and what it could bring back to this fund that we're trying to, to, to build, to reinvest. And we did a deep dive, and we're presenting today eight of those ideas. We broke this, the committee into subgroups, and each one of the faculty, we were all faculty, the majority of us were faculty on the committee, and we broke up into two groups, one, and they each went out and, and did the deep dive by talking to areas in the community that were, would be affected by this process or gathered the information that we needed in order to bring it to the committee today. We ranked the ideas in order by category, and then we finalized the proposals and made the recommendations to the steering committee. We presented 10 ideas at the last steering committee, and with that, they, they're uh, blessed, if you will, eight of those ideas to bring to the community. So with that, we're going to uh, introduce our eight ideas that we thought were, were uh, worth bringing forward and have been stamped at least to present to the community by the steering committee. I do want to say that when you look at these ideas and you see them posted on the screen, what you're seeing at the dollar figure is our best guess for this and, and doing the information that we, with the information that we had, we struggle with that quite a bit. We feel 
pretty strongly that we can achieve the goal here, but this is a five-year number that you're seeing. It's not an annual number, but I believe the packets themselves break that down into an annual number for you. So with that, I'll let Diane introduce the uh, eight ideas that we have. Thank you very much. The focus of all of these ideas is on an academic innovation that will increase the student engagement and the intellectual engagement of both students and faculty. So this one is increasing the number of hybrid courses. What this means is that a course that would generally meet for 150 minutes per week might only meet face to face for 100 minutes per week and the other 50 minutes would be in some kind of an interactive online engagement. Research has shown, in fact, that that is an academic improvement. Some people may think that it's not, but interestingly enough, the research shows that hybrid courses have a greater learning outcome capacity than just straight face-to-face -face or just straight online. Now, what is the, the gain for this? The gain is that it would allow free up more classroom space and eventually uh, eliminate some of the rental space that we have to use for classrooms. So the... Um, the savings down there is, is a total of six years, and if you look in your, a total of five years, this one says six years, if you look in your packet, you'll see the, the final annualized amount that we would hope would be returned thereafter on a year-by-year -year basis, and of course there's no reason why this couldn't grow. The second one has to do with increasing the number of study abroad programs. Now we have a fantastic study abroad office and one of the challenges they have been faced with is balancing between the fall and the spring. And this would attempt by creating actual cohorts, particularly within the professional schools such as engineering and business, cohorts of students who would go abroad in the fall to then create a, a greater balance between fall and spring, thereby freeing up beds on the campus and allowing us to admit a larger freshman class because we, are, we have a constraint on our cap. And so the revenue generated by this particular innovation would be allowing us to admit more students and the academic advantage is opening up more study abroad opportunities particularly for the students in the professional schools. This also has to do with study abroad and this is um, again expanding our capacity in that area. We have study abroad centers that primarily service GW students only and there are a number of universities that use their study abroad stu uh, centers to service students from other universities and this would allow us to, to fully realize the capacity of these centers. In fact we could even enhance the capacity capacity of the centers, but there is a, a projected revenue potential for the university by increasing our utilization of the study abroad centers by allowing students from other universities to take advantage of our centers. This is one that has to do with reorganizing the academic calendar and creating a Jan term, probably about a three-week term um, in January where, so that classes in the uh, when the spring semester would start probably the last week in January and that would allow us to create this three week mini term which would provide all kinds of exciting academic uh, intensive academic experiences for students potentially some abroad experience as well as on campus experience, uh, experiences. One of the interesting possible savings would be students who might come in with a lot of advanced credits and want to be able to graduate earlier, either in three and a half years or three years, and if they combined several Jan terms with their AP credits, with their academic, regular academic experience, they might in fact be able to graduate faster. But from the university's perspective, they would be revenue generated by the additional um, money students would pay to participate in this experience. The next three ideas are actually what we would call revenue neutral in that the, the savings that would be generated would be reallocated within the departments themselves. And these were ideas that actually came out through um, through the faculty who were again really focusing on how do we increase the, the intellectual depth of the academic experience. And so one idea are the signature interdisciplinary courses that could be four to six credit courses that would cross disciplines and uh, one of the potential savings might be decreasing the number of overall courses that students take but they would have several really deep experience in their courses that might be interdisciplinary. And any uh, revenue gaining or, or sharing would actually be going back to the departments that participated in this, allowing them to provide incentives to faculty for doing it. And so I think that it would, the academic experience would be enhanced and there might be some classroom space um, gained also. This is similar to the signature interdisciplinary courses. This is creating four-hour 
four credit hour pathways, and these would be courses probably in the junior or senior year that might be four credits instead of three, thereby cutting down on the number of courses that a student might take, but they might have, let's say they took three or four of these four credit courses, they would be more in-depth in their major, and this would be on a department-by-department -department basis. The incentive for the department to do this would be that there might be some internal savings realized that the department could re re reallocate internally, which would help um, provide incentives to faculty, perhaps do top-ups on their uh, sabbaticals. And so, th again, like the first I one, one that I just mentioned, the alloc reallocation is internal, but it might generate some sort of academic energy and intellectual depth and provide some innovative ways to give faculty some um, incentives for their research or for, the, for their sabbaticals. This was another idea that, w that uh, again, it's hard to, at this point, know what the um, revenue could be generated by this. There might be some additional revenue and that there might be some additional tuition, although, again, it might be what's part of the regular tuition package of the student. This is trying to increase the academic um, depth of internships and, and tying them to academic credit. So in the big picture, it might decrease one or two courses that a student might take and, and that they would do this internship and get actual academic credit for the internship, which would be closely monitored by faculty and, and have a, a strong academic component to it. So we, we weren't able to determine whether there would be savings attached. There would probably, in fact, be some costs, but it might be that that cost could actually be offset um, by perhaps decreasing the number of courses. The final one, the eighth one, is actually an example of an investment because one of the things our committee was really good at was coming at all sorts of things that we could invest the $60 million in and we had to keep trying to bring them around to come up with ideas that would help create the money to be invested. But this was one that was such a, a top priority that we decided to put it in and this of course has to do with Gelman and we're only focusing on the part of Gelman which would be creating collaborative learning um, environments and learning spaces for the students and the faculty, again focusing on this intellectual enrichment and student engagement that was a priority for our committee. And the overall renovation of Gelman would of course co cost much more than whatever we came up with, $1.5 million. But we were just talking about the, the ground, the first floor where, where some very interesting learning spaces could be created, which was kind of the focus of our committee. So those are our eight ideas. There were four that are revenue or savings generating, three that are revenue neutral, as far as we can tell, and one that would actually require investment. Thank you. We've can, uh, looked over over 200, closer to 250 ideas. And that, by the way, in itself was kind of neat, that students, um, staff, people all over the organization were uh, inputting ideas from the small to the large. And obviously, we're not going to be talking about the smaller ones, but we are dedicated and committed to making sure that a lot of these good things uh, happen. And so this is really, we're only, you know, maybe in ha halfway there in terms of uh, vetting and thinking about ideas. We spent time at the beginning talking about criteria. Now, for example, you'll see improved student, faculty, alumni, parent, and, and or staff experience is right down in the, it's the uh, fifth one from the top. But we all agreed from the get-go that it wasn't only going to be about coming up with some, some savings. That, in fact, you w wanted to make sure that you had a win-win scenario, that you had, it was aligned with GW's strategic goals and learning objectives for the, the organization. Minimum disruption. To, to current successful business processes and then the savings. We had talked about, you know, whether or not you set a number because that's extremely hard. Some of the ideas were very, you know, little amount in terms of the amount of savings, but they could be extremely useful. Uh, and then again, I mentioned the, the, the experience, the quality of the experience is key. Uh, does not require disproportionate investments up front must preserve or enhance quality of education. And when we said quick time, it's just that we didn't want something that was going to take, you know, 20 years to sit around figuring out how we were going to do it. And I think it's extremely important to point this out that, that on anything we do, that there are going to be multiple criteria and multiple stakeholders who are going to have different points of view. And this is, to me, uh, the first of one of many opportunities that people will be able to, to talk about and to give 
other opinions and other perspectives that, that we didn't have already. Now, we're going to trade off and go back and forth on presentations of um, the specific ideas. Of the seven ideas we've got, uh, strategic sourcing, telecommuting, re reduction of leased space, consolidation of the graduate admissions processing process, adding a GW temp agency, unifying our calendaring using technology, and entering into an energy consortium for natural gas in particular. Each of the facilitators at your team will tell you more about it, but we will talk about it at a fairly high level to introduce the, uh, the concept here today. The first one, um, let me tell you a, a brief story on this. So if someone thinks about uh, procurement, um, there's a lot within the university, over uh, $500 million that we expense. Uh, much of that is spent on procurement of a variety of, of things, from commodities to very specific systems. Um, let's take an individual who needs a new projector. Uh, the inclination may be to go online and dutifully look for the cheapest, uh, projector that's out there using specifications for lumens and and all, all all kinds of other specifications find that cheapest price point within the specifications that are required order that product receive it and feel like they've done the best thing by the university and and that was well intentioned let me give you a new scenario the scenario is we have other vendors out there who also make and distribute uh, projectors but they may be individuals that you haven't thought of necessarily as a source for projectors. So, for example, today we spend a lot of money with Hewlett Packard and Dell on largely computers and peripherals. Uh, however, when you think about uh, the deep discounts and the structure that we have there from uh, a contractual standpoint, the discounts are typically far greater than the cheapest available on the Internet, and they also sell projectors. And so taking a more strategic look at how we procure things, what might have been uh, over overlooked, comes into the puzzle in a more structured manner and their savings that we can contribute uh, in that way. Imagine you didn't have to come here today because uh, we fed it over the web. Um, in many ways, some, some of these ideas are catch-up ideas. Nonetheless, they're innovative for GW. Uh, telecommuting has been occurring around the world for many, many years. Uh, in the past, people had to sign up for ISDN lines. Any of you remember ISDN? I heard uh, PB was telling me before ISDN there was ISN. Um, you can figure out what the D is. But it was much harder and it was much more expensive and there were less tools available to, to telecommute, but yet yeah, people did it. IBM today has over 60% of their workforce that work uh, from, from a remote location. Um, they're also highly uh, distributed and I think there's benefits that can come from that. So it's certainly something that is feasible uh, for us. We have to work through things like how to equip individuals, which jobs would be jobs that would be conducive to working remotely, performance, uh, implications, et cetera, details, but nonetheless I think something that's been proven and we see it as one of those positive sum game opportunities where employees would enjoy the opportunity to do, to do so. Lease space. Uh, we spend over, I don't know what the total amount is, but we've got about 50,000 square feet of which we would save roughly two million dollars um, by consolidating, moving folks uh, on the administrative side out to the Ashburn campus as we continue to grow uh, that center. And those savings would not only allow us to uh, be wiser stewards of the assets that we have, but the consolidation that can come uh, on, on the main campus I think would be significantly beneficial to the university. One of the things we talked about a lot in the, the committee was the difference between consolidation and centralization. That is, you can consolidate services or processes, but we recognize that you don't want to centralize decision making. Admissions is, is, a, is a very good example of this. This is not to say that somebody is going to be making decisions on who's going to be admitted to uh, programs for our university, but um, the idea was uh, was brought up to us to consolidate the graduate admissions uh, much like the undergraduate admissions are. Because right now, there, for example, the 31 people, at least 31 staff positions across the university that are dealing with graduate uh, admissions across the, the, the different schools. And so, for example, uh, evidently Stanford processes, processes 25,000 graduate applications with a staff of three uh, in a uh, centralized office. And a lot of other universities do this as well, for example, MIT and UC Berkeley and other, other organizations. So it's not like we didn't get this, you know, off the moon or something. I mean, the, the, that um, the idea is that 
from somebody who's also been a department chair for 25 years. Um, and if the idea that maybe you wouldn't worry about people's GRE scores going to another school that somehow you, you don't get it for three months or whatever, the, the thought was that there might be some really efficiencies and better um, experiences for the students submitting all of those variety of pieces of, of material, whether it's online or, you know, some of it isn't necessarily just online. So this is a thought. I know that there are going to be uh, more stakeholders that are going to be, um, you know, talking a, about some how you would actually go a, a, about implementing this. You know, devils in the details. So that's why we need to talk about some of these ideas. I'm sure that many of you have had the experience when you have a, a period between a, a staff member leaving and before you get a new one hired, that you go out and spend, which I think are sort of outrageous uh, amounts to uh, temp agencies to, to bring in people. And so the thought was, I remember that win-win scenario, was that why not provide benefits for our own students and having with maybe a, a, an office that might have a cost of uh, one or two staff to, to actually staff that um, have the ability of students to go ahead and uh, fill in these positions. It would be more money in the pockets of the students and we would be spending less of that overhead that you actually pay those the contractors of those those agencies that you get. Um, the average cost there is $25 and that's the average. In other words, the, it goes up uh, in some of the positions that we're already spending uh, more money. And, and again, I just want to focus that this is something that we felt, and the, the students on our committee as well, thought that this would be something that would be extremely appealing because it would be something, you know, for example, right on campus where people would be able, the students would be able to go in. It would be easy on them as well as more cost effective uh, for us. And hey, we'd have very, very smart people working on staff. An article was written in the Harvard Business Review in November, and, and of the many things I've read through this process, there was this one concept that I found very helpful and offer it to you today as you think about these things. And that was, as, as you begin innovative thinking, it's real important to ask yourself the question, if we couldn't do it in this way today, or we couldn't sell the product that we have, or we couldn't do this or that, uh, and we had no choice, it just we can't maintain the status quo, then what would you do? How would you solve that problem? And I thought it was very helpful and it's applicable to how we do calendaring today. So I think you all know how we do it and the magnitude. Uh, it's very manually intensive. Lots of phone calls are involved, et cetera. If we couldn't do it in that way, uh, how could we do calendaring at the university? What tools are available? And with anything, that, there's change involved. There are many uh, human resources that are used for calendaring today, but remember, as we continue to invest on, on the other side of it, there will be need for resources as well. So think about how you might do calendaring different and then we'll solve the reallocation of those resources in a separate way. And calendaring is just one example, but one where we think you know, there are opportunities to take advantage of technologies. The CAP program that the Office of Sustainability has been working is working to find ways in which we can be wiser stewards of uh, energy uh, in general. Our work on this particular one was for the net consumption of energy that we end up with, how might we be more cost effective in dealing with those? Uh, the idea that's before you today is that we enter into a consortium with other uh, like-minded and, and chartered organizations in and around DC um, to, to leverage and build negotiating efficiencies on, on natural gas, as an example, and we think there's at least 5% of savings on a pretty large bill in that regard, and that may be uh, a seed to grow in, in other areas. We are really committed to seeing this as a beginning of a process, not an end. And that, and I mean not even by just looking for a few ideas and trying to implement them. But, and I, and I believe that uh, President Knapp is actually very much committed to the idea of a continuing process to solicit ideas and to making sure there's accountability. So all these people that have spent their time writing up the rationales and so on, um, here back. And for example, we have already bundled ideas to send to appropriate places in the university because it's not going to be these committee's you know, responsibility for the long run to making sure these things get done. But there are lots of really good ideas that we are you know, not going to talk about in these uh, four or anything, but um, need to be passed on and make sure that and have, have some follow-up will be really important. Thank you very much. We're going to give you two opportunities, two 20-minute opportunities, to sit at a table and provide your input on 
uh, on one idea each. And what we're trying to do here is to get your input. The facilitators may add or answer two or three questions about the idea, but they're primarily there to get you to talk, to get the input. And that's why we have the note takers. Now be assured that if you can't, it, you may have four ideas you want to provide input on. You can provide that because we have cards at the tables. You can fill out your ideas there and we have a box on the way out. Secondly, all of our top ideas are on the website. And we encourage you to get, uh, if you want to get on the website, make your, your voice known on that. Now, what I'd like to ask you to do, if you will get to those tables right now, I'm going to give you about 20 minutes. I don't know if this is an innovative idea, but when you hear this, that means you must move to another table. Um, there's definitely a lot of interest we've heard about a unified events calendar, but this is really thinking about your own calendar management. Some people are still um, you know, using paper, some people are using GY, some people are using Google, some people are using uh, Outlook, um, and there's a lot of events. So, I think I heard some passionate support for it, so I'm going to go ahead and write that word down. That's okay. Passionate support. Passionate support. What are other feedback thoughts? You know, I've been here only about a year and a half, but I have to say I was absolutely shocked when I got here. I was expecting Outlook, to be honest. Used to that, used to calendaring, used to being able to click on, you know, invite the resource to the meeting, automatically reserve the, the space. The number of emails that I had received to get one meeting scheduled, I mean, I'm talking like six to ten. And so it's time wasted. Um, just trying to figure out who's available when and then figure out what space is available. Um, so I think that that's actually something when people come to work here, they expect to be able to do something like that quickly. Um, and just being able to also populate like an outlook when you go through the name is you can pull the directory and pull them out here to invite them easier to do that also. Just having unified technology. We use GroupWise in our division simply because it allows us to calendar and schedule each other. It's a really bad system compared to Outlook. We all use it because it's, it's what we need to schedule each other. You have to reduce. The only way you can do it is you have to think in terms of class sessions. How many class sessions can you eliminate? Uh, if you have to look I mean, there may be a way to really study it intensively and change the schedule and the time bands and figure that There may be ways to get more back. Yeah, you would need more people. You have, you would need more technology support. Uh, I might find that if you're doing this, I don't know what the impact would be on storage and blackboard. You might have to buy more storage for blackboard. Uh, it might even, I don't know, you could speak to this better than I could, but that increase the utilization rate in the existing technology classrooms. What does that do to your uh, consumables, your bulbs, your filters, uh, your life cycle on the equipment in the rooms? I mean, there are all kinds of things that I can add to but I don't see a counter but hybrids, are we looking at um, doing some kind of uh, video of the classrooms, like some kind of streaming video and maybe making the classroom smaller rather than auditoriums? So people can watch online and somebody can actually do that. Because they could be able to use a smaller classroom at the moment. Could have been another idea that they're willing to think about other things in relation to it. It doesn't seem like there's much of a downside to it. It's a matter of how do you get people to, this is what thinking about how you do it differently, how do you get the halls ready, and how do you get faculty to work during those three weeks that they typically take them off as well. Is your sense that this would be, this would be successful in getting folks to buy them? Just well, I think that was them? the reason for the just five the first year and then the new five and another five because there's going to have to be those five pioneers and then five more people and so on. So I think, and there will be incentive. The faculty will be paid to do this. One thing that's where I could see this possibly going, none of the, well, except, except for professional studies, I think, we're, we're still, we still have one foot in the 20th century, 
and one foot in the 21st in terms of processing applications. Paper versus electronic. Yes. yes. So, so, the, so the applications are coming in electronically, but then we we're, to paper. We're, we're printing them, and, and, uh, which is really pretty simple. You know? So we have these paper applications, and one, you know, that I, you know, we, I don't know how much detail to go into, but it's just, it's just hard to describe. And if there's some way that this could result in graduate admissions doing what eventually we're going to be doing anyway, and that is going to a, a purely electronic application, uh, then I'm all for it. And we've facilitated that, and as CPS but, has actually done it, but, but, it's, but it's, we it's try a, not, it's a, it's a, commission, it's graduate huge, stuff is yeah. very personal, it's like herding sheep, it's not like herding sheep, it's like herding cats, undergraduates herding cats, graduates like herding, undergraduates herding sheep, graduates herding cats, all of our schools are a little different, and we found that we've tried not to mandate to the faculty of the schools, oh, now you have to go online and spend all your time reading essays and things. We let the schools mandate that if they want yeah. to, which you did, actually. <laughs> Tell us about that. What do you think? Um, well, what I, where I think there could be advantages um, with, this, we, this, with this, this, mm -hmm. or this process mm -hmm. would be, um, well, one of the reasons why we've been able to uh, increase enrollments and not really increase the number of staff members is because Kristen does work hard to keep up with the techn technological advances that we can leverage. Um, that in a sense the students then manage the application process themselves. They go online, they fill it out, and you know it's not a lot of and, and then the the teams at schools by loading up the decisions um, into the system where somebody can log out at two o'clock in the morning and say, Oh good, they got my transcript from the University of Minnesota and thank you. So a lot of that she has helped me facilitate with. But what I have found with our team is that we are loading a lot of the things up well, things that the students can't upload themselves. Such as the transcript now, because not all the in the scan. That if you could have a team of people who are these GWU students, temp the temps, agency, yeah, here's the temp scanning agency. the stuff in, if we had super scanning machines. That was a fairly substantial incentive for students. If you look at 14000 as an average cost, and you take a look at tuition and what we're charging, even if you minus out enough to bring it down to that level, and people might look at $4,000 tuition rate and say, wow, sure, that's a big tuition rate. But do, do you do any marketing to other schools at this point for, uh, for international um, for, for the study centers and for those? I mean, we, we have some things, we do through IID uh, publications there, we do advertise programs. We have one student that we've created in the past three or four years. So it's been a large, it has been a few areas that I think that would be helpful to think about. One is whether or not a student's health insurance would cover them abroad. Mm -hmm. And that our, our GW health insurance plan for students would cover them while traveling abroad. But if they're on their parents' plan and we're requiring them to go, we have to ensure that we can be covering them some yeah. way if they go abroad. The second would be that most of the programs are not in English, so we'd have to show a language proficiency by sophomore year. So we might want, and I know that we've just re reduced the foreign language requirement for general curriculum. So given that, we would have to be clear with these people that they had to complete those language requirements before they go. Otherwise, you can't take a sophomore level course in a foreign language and get enough out of it materially and even converse in the language. Yeah, and, and that's when I talk about we have to do the deeper dive. That's part of this, is getting all the folks involved with this to really do a full study and understand it from your office, from all the different options across the, the university as well as the academic side and what that really means to the academic curriculum. So, one way to make it enticing to be more positive rather than to say here are some potential pitfalls it's just like we say to them for some of the programs, you pay GW tuition, you get to go to that school. We could also say to them, you pay GW housing costs, and we'll provide housing for all. I think that would make it easier for people to know that they could just pay the standard tuition and housing fees, and if everything
everything is just going to be arranged for them there, they don't, then they don't have to think, oh, what are the extra expenses <laughs> of living? Because even when you go to the Madrid program, for example, you have the option of living in a home, living in an apartment, living in lots of things like that that can really vary the cost of living abroad. Mm -hmm. Is that there's a whole other um, the, uh, sustainability office, and whole, there's a whole other office. Sometimes when ideas came up that were like about energy savings, we kept saying, "Oh no, that goes to them." And we so we are artificially saying, you know, kind of one took that that aspect of it out. Not that, that isn't a good idea, but that it demonstrates that a lot of the yeah that a lot of these ideas uh, you know can border on a lot of the things we're talking about. Really, were about um, energy. You know, like we talked a lot about, for example. Scanning records instead of you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to reduce um, energy. But anyway, so yes, I think it's worthwhile saying that and making sure that we see how that's, that relates to it. I can understand, I guess, from a business standpoint, what is the value right now that's kind of sort of that sort of as well. Just agree with it. I feel like it's. You know, if we want to be really innovative, I'd like to see going in a step further. Let's skip that step. <laughs> or, um, I don't know, there's this whole new team that's very interesting to see how much, I guess, my building can be for, right? To see how much carbon emissions and you know the giant carbon footprints that is being planted there just to make you guys feel any meaning or any way. I don't know, I, I mean I don't really know how big it's gonna be. How do I make sure I'd like to see it go for the way of the door just to the I know there's concepts going on there. I know. One being the innovator speaking to the program that's kind of leaning towards going green and the whole idea that it's something that the school stands for, and then what I, what I really see in this is a pure cost savings initiative. Right? Going out there, how can we simply reduce costs, and by doing so, joining forces with other institutions. What I think is important here is, is how we choose those other institutions that are kind of aligned with. I think that it's an opportunity where, I think it's a great opportunity where we can say and be proud of who we kind of form this consortium. I think a lot of care needs to be taken. So, could you elaborate in terms of what do you mean? Yeah, what kind of data? Yeah, or criteria, yeah. Um, well, in other academic institutions, it would be, it would be probably a pretty safe bet. I mean, I'd, I'd have to really look into it, but I think that it's a place where you can use it as a marketing aspect. I mean, look at, look at who we're aligning with. Something that we should be able to step back and say we're proud of doing it, not just because it's a financial situation. So kind of those two points there. I, I think that actually kind of touches on your concern as well. Right? I mean, I know it's more meaning that if we're taking a, uh, an energy position and, and something that we can be proud of. I know you want to go a little further with it. Right, and I think that you'll find one other idea and sit at that table. You have another 20 minutes. Thank you. I think you know, I would love to see what days people like to tell the news that they're Mondays and Fridays, <laughs> except for the, your folks, sounds like they're out for the whole time, right, right during the job, which right. is interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think then, you know, just introducing fairness and, you know, get to, not everybody can have Monday and not everybody can have Friday and, and if the person who has Monday maybe for six months People and switches that. over to a Wednesday, well, you know, those are the good. kind of things that... I would imagine that <laughs> we're not even limited to one day a week. Okay. No, that's, that's, my, that's my question. Is, is this assumption? I guess I assume that this was based upon 
that they were still communicating permanently as opposed to a, you know, a few days a week. I think but that, I'm not I think sure. That, I think that there's, there's a full range, a full uh -huh. opportunity in terms of flavors here. The question is to ask well, what are those different opportunities uh, that, that people would be interested in and what are the challenges if, for example, you had staff in your office who were entirely distance mm -hmm. uh, and telecommuting for staff who were there uh, three days out of the week or two days out of the week. Mm -hmm. What would be the concerns uh, under those uh, circumstances to be able to have continuity of operation? What do you think? The supervisory challenge is, is the big one. I mean, I, you, know, you kind of hit on it. Are they working? I mean, if you have output measures, uh, you know, depending upon the nature of the work, um, may, you know, those kinds of jobs lend themselves well. And so, you know, just in my experience, uh, this external attorney is reviewing a certain number of contracts, and I can see the performance of her reviews of those contracts, and so I can have some assurance she has worked the requisite number of hours, and I don't really care whether it's nine to five or, or whatever, but a lot of jobs are harder to measure like that, and so you never really know what they're doing. This uh, this focus really is on increasing our presence in the more competitive market, so we get more students from outside to come and be part of our program. Uh, the other one is we get more students, GW students. This has a little bit different. Let's start. Are there questions you have about the proposal? We assume that we have a really good study abroad program, which we do, and we're expanding that internally. So building centers and expanding our program. And the question is, could we expand that in such a way that we could draw students from other universities? And in doing that, clearly you have to ask the question, who are our competitors? What are they offering? What kind of competitive advantage do we have? So, and, and Joel uh, is great because Joel is a strategist who spends time thinking about things like that too. Right? <laughs> so that's what that's what we're trying to do. So, are there ways that we can expand our current program to draw students to draw students to other schools, and then that would enhance our revenue? Are you doing this study abroad? Are you planning? Or have you done one? Um, I'm planning on going next spring. Okay. Uh, and I'm really interested. One thing I'm really interested in, I kind of talked about it a little bit last table, is having an internship component to the study abroad, um, to the study abroad program. And not just sort of like software, but even like promoting. Um, so if I go with some sort of like a really high, high level, high caliber internship, I think that would really draw a lot of people. I mean, GW is known for having students who are involved in, you know, politics and internships. And everyone graduates at least two or three internships under their belt. And so that's one of my main things. The student here is I want to see, like, I want to be able to apply to study abroad office and have also part of that program and internships that I can do. When you talk about high, I guess high level internships, what are you talking about? So it's something other than sweeping the floor. Yes, obviously. What I mean is, like, um, for example, if you were to get an internship with a, like a, a big multinational company okay. that, that's well known, um, and if you somehow GW was able to secure, like, maybe a certain spot at that company every semester and they just had to fill it, then GW could advertise to. To, you know, uh, GW students and students outside of GW students, like, we have, this, we have this study abroad program, not only can you go take classes, but you can also go in two or three days a week as an intern for a huge amount of cash. Or even like a, like a political group. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm interested in. So, that would really competitive advantage. It really would. I mean, that's what people are looking for. People aren't necessarily, students aren't necessarily wanting to go abroad to study as much, but they also want to sign up have, like, work experience. I mean, the job market's very genuine. So people want to be able to have that experience. Would you be willing to extend your semester by a month or so in order to do this? Absolutely. And I'd like, like an order traditional spring if you had to stay all of May to do that. Because, for example, the Paris Study Center, the French don't do Friday internships. Uh, they, they're kind of a co-op strategy. So they really, we want you in the office all the time and we've never, you know, 
coming in half a day or two days a week destroys our our, our, our walk. So you know, we want you all the time or not at all. Yeah, we have an incredibly educated neighborhood here. We have retired foreign service, State Department, World Bank, etc. A lot of these folks don't want to work 40 hours a week anymore, but they've retired and would love to come back in a temporary capacity. They have to come to our office looking for work, part-time work. The university just doesn't have a lot of those positions. But we may have a lot of those temporary positions would be kind of a built-in cadre of very talented people who would love to come in for a month or two months or four or two weeks, depending on the need. So I think there's a lot of potential there. It's a great idea. And one, I don't think that was, was going to have a little consider to right. talk about. Uh, it was discussed that this would potentially be open to you know, employees outside, the, outside yeah. of students. So that was It has to be a faculty member. Yeah, I, you know, my because they hear right, right, the academics the because they're the determiners. They right. As compared to what you described, I think the expectation here is strongly that the uh, credit is connected to you got to earn it. Absolutely, it has, a, it has a fundamental academic. There is an academic portion of this. I forgot that part because it wasn't a particularly difficult portion. It was you know, kind of keeping the journal so experience and bi-weekly reporting of it. And who was it submitted to? So there so I it was many years ago. Just that many. I think it was to the applied study office. Kind of yeah, I'm saying so pass so fail. Are you, you putting this effort forward? I could be misremembering. What you said is another interesting point that was not recognized here, that you get the credit and it doesn't affect your GPA, right? Well, I'm, so, I'm saying, you mentioned, you know, if you work more than 20 hours, so you show No, but, you're, but the credits don't have attached to it a grade. A grade. Oh, right. So, if you're, then you're taking a smaller number of classroom type courses, and it's just been, it's been very different. But I, but I think doing so, to, to what I started with, doing some sort of analysis, I don't know that we have this, as to, even if you look at faculty, like, so a lot of people maybe don't teach at the end of the week, it's some sort of analysis that says, okay, this division has more people in the office at this time of the week, and, stuff. and I don't know if we have any information or knowledge about that at this point, um, but if there can be sort of any sort of benchmarking done to see what, maybe there's some overlap in certain areas. It's analogous to, to saving the classroom. So today, you need enough classrooms to accommodate the time band, which is 6, 10 p.m. And, you know, whether or not you can get out of that and reduce the footprint of classrooms, it's all going to be dependent on your peak demand. And 6, 10, to shift the demand, it's almost impossible because those are working professionals coming into graduate programs. You can't push them out. So the whole idea of how you want to last week or get out of the 2020K lease, get out of the 1776 G lease, is very fragile, I think. You can't, you can't get too excited about it until you do those other analysis. I think that telecommuting is key because, you know, when you talk about the loss of staff, and I, I'm very familiar with the one situation you brought up, and that had a serious customer service impact for about a year. I mean, it really did. Um, you know, just a, a couple thoughts I want to toss out because they're, this is the innovation of password. Um, is the, does it have to be Loudon? Is there cheaper lease space here and Loudon that's something, you know, a middle of the road? I think where we wouldn't lose as many. 
Well, no, but that, that, that's the same point. I, yeah. I, I said years ago, I said, why did why did all these people not get allowed to come? Of course, the university owns a building. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And is, you know, could you not own a building in Arlington or Alexandria or somewhere within the Beltway that is still very close to the rents or whatever you'd have there, but it wouldn't be the downtown rents? Exactly. So you'd still save two thirds, but but it wouldn't necessarily be way out there where the service becomes more problematic. Yeah, and I think we're, and from what I'm seeing, is aren't we almost out of space and loud in any way, so we may be in a decision, are we going to build another building? I don't know. The innovation is to look at that, exactly that, and not only, if you if you find a place where you can save the body, so to speak, we're not talking about putting people out on the street. Right. What we're talking about is re reallocation and refocusing them. When you think, when you say that you think this is the tip of the iceberg, can you give me a, you know, just give me one uh, someplace else where you'd see that kind of conspicuous you think would be an advantage? Well, I think us. I think we've seen that in Colonial Center. So that office is now existing, and it's probably getting to the point where we can start to right size it a little bit more. So it has, let's say, let's say it's 35 people down there. Eventually, using the technology, it might get down to 25 people. And its goal will never maybe put itself out of business, but its goal will be to have a smaller footprint and move other services in there. You know, so maybe you have housing in there, or maybe you have dining in there, because you have more space, and those people can be reallocated to do that work. Or the, the technology allows us to do some of this online, and that what we're doing, and you walk into today, or you have to call for, you eventually can do in a totally automated way. And I think that's really the vision is. We get to a more self-service, populated experience as opposed to I have to go to this office, then I have to go to this office, then I have to go to this office, which we all see. We saw, see those it's like paperwork process that you talk about. Where it's like, how is it that I still have to go sign this form? It's crazy. Or students, I think, think that about us. I mean, I think as employees, we've grown accustomed to it, but I think students are frustrated by it because in their other lives, they don't have to do it. <laughs> I know travel is a big deal, like the, uh, aside from the daily commuting, uh, you know, the development office and law school, those are areas where they do a lot of traveling, either faculty traveling elsewhere or bringing folks in and paying for their travel. And so through a strategic sourcing program, uh, hopefully there will be areas to save by you know, ach achieving some volume discounts and airfare, and volume discounts and hotels, and while it would not necessarily it would, it would restrict people to fewer choices in flying and where, where people stay. The amount of money you can save at universities that can be reallocated into academic areas is significant. And it requires a little bit of a change in the way we do travel for us here today. Also, uh, um, very precious points that the other thing the energy table green touch is that we can do partnership with some vendors. And if we have a big net, network, and uh, that will enhance our negotiation power, I guess, between those vendors for the business. We thank all of you for coming today. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your input in particular. And don't hesitate to get in touch with us 